senior chemist here at the Wind Waterworks. If my memory serves me quite correctly, I'm, I'm gambling just a bit here, but you got nursing uh, students here in front of you, and I think there's probably some nursing professionals in your family tree. Is this true? Yeah, three of them. My so, mom's a nurse, my sister's a nurse, and I have a son that nurse in Des Moines. Okay. You're amongst friends. <laughs> give, give I'm home now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do your thing. Uh, you got any nice... Uh, Zesty racking river water today. Yes, this I do. Okay. He's got some visual things. I think I'll help drive home how this treatment process works. I want to tell you a little bit about where we get our water and how we go about cleaning it. And we have three sources. And I'll pull this one first. I just have to give her a glass of water. There we go. And so here we have Raccoon River, which is usually our main source of water because it's nice and close. Here's the infiltration gallery. And I already told you about that this water goes through 20 feet of dirt before it gets to this point. So natural filtered. Natural filtered. Those guys 110 years ago were very smart. I'm going to use this water in a minute to show you how we go about cleaning up our water. Today we're going to use about 16 million gallons out of the infiltration gallery at this plant and about 11 million gallons out of the Des Moines River. And to give you a rough idea, because in the water industry, they throw a million gallons a day around all the time, and that just sounds like a lot to everyone else. If you took everything out of this room and filled it with water, that'd be about a quarter of a million gallons. Okay, that's one of those geek things I did one day when I was practicing for tours. Um, <laughs> I have this raccoon river water sample, and we're going to add some chemicals to that to clean that up. This is going to happen way faster because I'm going to use stronger chemicals than what we normally use because I don't have very long to show you. Um, one of the chemicals we will add is powder activated carbon and what it does is it grabs onto organic materials such as pesticides and herbicides that may be in our river water. We don't want that getting through our process. And then we have this chemical, it's very chloride, it's coagulant. And for people who don't do a lot of geeky chemistry stuff, I tell them it's like a dirt magnet, okay? So it, it takes all the charges off those dirt particles and they're attracted to iron. Iron is more dense than water and so it will sink to the bottom with all the dirt. And the next compound I'm going to add is lime. And what it does, it raise the pH of the water to about 11, 11 and a half and makes the ferric chloride work much more efficiently. As you can see, it's starting to make some chunks. And those chunks are dirt particles wrapping themselves around the iron. Okay. Let that mix for just a second. Let's figure out which way to turn this dirt thing. This sample right here is what we actually get in our plant. Okay. So this is normal concentration of chemicals, more mild dirt, and if you look, it looks a little bit like dirty snow. And you see how the top of this starts there already, those con chemicals are way more concentrated than what this is, and this process there takes about 6 to 12 hours across the bottom basin. Okay. After we go through this, and that drops out. Mix that up. We got something called a flocculator. And instead of a giant stir bar, we have those things that makes the chemical around. And they're approximately the height of the ceiling and about the width of this room. Okay. And so if you notice the motors outside, some of those are those chains are driving the paddles down the bottom. At the other end, where we have this can't let all that stuff build up because it might be 10 to 20 feet deep and then we can't pump a water through. They have those light boards that are drug across the bottom of those basins to remove that material. And that takes that material to the end of one of the basins and then it's pushed over to that round silver building over there. When it hits that building, the solids go to the bottom and then they're pushed down one more building to where we have the presses we have 50 ton presses in there, that material is basically squished, and the solids go up to about 55%. Below that we have 
company that has semi down there, they drop that material straight into a semi, and then they take it for either land application, they can use it to graze the pH of the water, I mean the pH of the dirt, or their farming operations, or back in April of last year, it became approved to use that material to fill in abandoned land, um, abandoned coal mines and stuff, so that way we don't have less problems with sinkholes. Okay. After we get through this part, then we had carbon dioxide in the water, and that's the bubbly stuff in the pop, and that lowers the pH to about 9.5, and then it goes into 16 giant sand filters, which you haven't seen yet, have you? They're going to see them again. They walk through the filter building. Okay, so now you know what they are when you're looking at those giant sand boxes, and we're going to add chlorine to the water, so any bacteria that may have survived that process between getting cooked to pH 11 and a half and the ferric chloride will kill them off. Then we add fluoride to the water, about 0.7 milligrams per liter, and then it goes into a 10 million gallon clear well. And that clear well is the source of water for the distribution system for this plant. So anyone that gets water directly from here at their house or industries or those water towers, I'll get it from that clear well. In the lab, one of the things we do is we have to check our water from start to finish. And so one of the tests we do is called turbidity. And here we have a turbidity standard, and this is about 10 turbidity units. And you can see where that looks pretty clear. I toured with a couple of fourth graders this week, and one of the kids said he'd drink this. <laughs> this is 30 times cloudier than what we could send out of this plant at any given time. The sample here. About 600. Now you can see with the naked eye. And sometimes, after a two inch thunderstorm, you start getting stuff like this. And I've seen it as high, is in the river, Raccoon River as high as a couple thousand. Maybe 6,000 might have been the highest one. And so that makes us want to change rivers because even though the Raccoon River is just over the hill, so pumping costs are very, very low for the Raccoon River. It's like if it starts doing stuff like this, well, we have to add a whole bunch of chemicals to that, and it's sort of hard to manage that when we have a 24-hour lag time between start and finish. And so it's much easier to have an additional pumping cost to go to the Des Moines River because as water comes down the center of the lake and hits the center of the lake, it loses all its speed, it drops all the dirt, and that dirt holds a whole bunch of different things besides bacteria and different chemicals. And so then it has a short period of time between when it leaves the dam and gets to our intake. So it's much cleaner, much more consistent. Not as consistent as the gallery, because that's not directly surface water, but way more consistent than what we have. Okay. That's the first part of the process. We've got to see how our water is looking when it comes into the plant. And I'll tell you more about monitoring in the plant. But as it leaves, then we also have 1,400 miles of pipe that we want to make sure the water doesn't change too much between here and people's houses. And so what we try to do is we have water that's slightly depositing. You have two choices when you're sending water out. You can either be slightly depositing, which means it puts a very thin layer of calcium carbonate on the inside of the pipe, or it can be corrosive, which means it takes out stuff out of the pipe. It can't be perfect. It's impossible we have 1,400 miles of pipe. You can't have perfect. So we err on the side of caution. I don't know if you can see in there or not with that. So you're going to pass that around. That's the slightly depositing water. And the other option you have is corrosive water and copper when it rusts. Turns slightly blue or green inside. I'm sure everyone here heard about the problem they had in Flint, Michigan. Okay. And in Flint, Michigan, they had been using water from Detroit that had been slightly depositing for years and years and years. Okay. Or had much problem. Well, then they decided to save some money and change river sources and also not do enough research or put enough money in chemicals and change where they're getting the water. And what happened was then they wound up with water that was corrosive. And so all the material that had been coating on the inside of the pipes was starting to leach off and coming off in chunks. So people were getting lead levels 
thousands of times higher than what you can send out any plant at any given time for the EPA rules. So they finally got that straightened out. <laughs> or just didn't do the research that they had. And now this plant, well, for Des Moines Waterworks, before Flint, Michigan occurred, every three years we would need to do 60 lead and copper samples. So we'd send bottles to people's houses, they'd stick it underneath the sink and collect a liter of water and we'd test the lead and copper. Then Flint, Michigan happened and everyone got stressed out. So now we do 100 lead and copper samples. We did 100 last six months, we're going to do another 100 this six months. Once we pass those, then I assume we pass the first six months just fine. And I assume we'll go back to reduced monitoring, which is where we were sampling once every three years. Okay, because testing costs are, I mean, it's not cheap to test your water. And so if they, you keep getting zeros, then the DNR changes it so that way you don't have to monitor as often. If we had 10% of our samples at people's houses were over the actual level, then the DNR would change that so that we'd be monitoring more often. And I do that with any of the contaminants that they regulate. So far? I want to add to that. We talked about an initial couple rounds of sampling that would derive us toward reduced sampling and monitoring down to once every three years. This is an example where regulations are good, but regulations sometimes don't always give you the security that you really need. If you're sampling every three years and things are good when you do your analysis, and then if people lose sight of that, don't do their jobs, you can have a two or three year window where things are not where they need to be. So there are other things that Terry and others look at far more frequently, daily basis, near daily basis, in regard to the depositing nature of the water leaving these treatment plants. So I don't know, just a point of interest, complying with the regulation is something certainly we have to do, but we also need to be mindful that it doesn't always give us the security that some might think comes with compliance. There's more to be done is all I'm saying. On those lines, there's a nasty calculation called Langler's Index. And what that is, it's a combination of pH and calcium hardness and alkalinity and conductivity and all that goes into a complicated formula. And that determines whether your water is aggressive or depositing. And so that calculation gets done for this plant every day. And so that's one of the ways that we can double check that as we go during that three year period. And over here, we have several different things, tests we do. First one's turbidity, and so we'll monitor for all these things. We'll monitor our river samples, we'll monitor before and after they go into the treatment basins, and we also monitor our finished water at all three plants. We also do alkalinity and hardness, and pH over here, and then over along this row, we have several different instruments that we use to test for, for example, these first two are gas chromatographs and mass spectrometers. And if you've watched CSI, you've probably heard of those. They work way faster on CSI than what they do here. <laughs> first one, we can use to test for pesticides and herbicides. Second one, we use to test for volatile organic chemicals. So if you look on the back of a paint can, They'll say something about VOC concentration. That's the stuff you smell. Okay. And so if you have organic materials such as dead leaves and stuff, and you add chlorine to the water, then you can form something called trihalomethane. One of those you've heard of is probably chloroform. Okay. And the state of California, this is if you're above 80 parts per billion, then that's a violation. So that's your those four compounds make up your 80 parts per billion. We can also test for other compounds where we did have a customer several years ago that complained that the water smelled of gasoline. And so we asked them to bring them a sample. And so they, we, I had to have some type of way to test for gasoline. So I went down to vehicle maintenance and asked them if I could have some gasoline. They are like, how much gasoline do you want? And I said, I need a drop and I'm going to have to loot that a whole bunch. So we ran that and there wasn't a gasoline here. Then someone started asking more questions about where the sample was. Well, someone had got a glass of water out of the sink and the sink was in the garage part of not a repair shop. So we're assuming someone dumps gasoline down the sink and then someone got a glass of water shortly after that without knowing about it. It's a weird 
stuff like that occasionally happens. <laughs> the next instrument where that vent's coming out of the ceiling, the long name for it is the Atomic Absorption Spectrophotometer. Doesn't mean anything to you. Anyway, what we use that for is test for different metals. That's me. <laughs> And we can test for such things as lead and copper, which you imagine we do. It can also test for other heavy metals such as cadmium, nickel, chromium, zinc, and those type of things. We had a customer one time that came in and the water out of the drinking fountains out of this office building was the color of my gloves, which is a problem. People don't like that. And so we determined that they were having copper concentrations in their water at about five to six milligrams per liter, which is the action level, I mean, the MCL is four. So we don't be able to. Well, we figured out the pH was low. The water out of here is about pH 9.5 to about 9.8. And it was sitting around seven. And most people know that pH of seven is neutral. However, when you add different combinations of factors, that can be in the aggressive range. And so what had happened was, well, they had someone redo their cafeteria. When they redid their cafeteria, they put a pot machine and they did not put something called a backflow converter on their carbon dioxide tank. So it was pumping carbon dioxide in the water. When you add carbon dioxide to the water, it makes something called carbonic acid. And so the pH was getting driven that range. So once they fixed that, then their water stopped being blue. Now, now we have two other instruments called ion chromatographs. And what they can do is they test for, they can test for nitrate and phosphate and Fluoride, we have tests for fluoride every single day because we have the water. And you probably heard about nitrate in water since you live in Des Moines. And beyond that, we also have um, microsystem, microtoxin testing thing for cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are algae that can create cyanotoxins. And so that instrument back there can test for those four things using the lysine. Okay. Then you have to up in the spring. The spring, when you're at a surface water treatment plant, is a painful time of year, okay? <laughs> because in the wintertime, the rivers freeze, but then in the spring, they thaw out, and then that ice starts grinding up the bottom of the river and starts kicking up all that stuff. And all that dirt in the bottom of the river has organic carbon in it, so stuff, dirt's been deposited, organic material, and also ammonia. Both those chemicals chew up chlorine just terribly. And we have to have chlorine throughout our system and to the farthest person at about 0.3 milligrams per liter. And so if we can't get it all the way out there, we have to increase the concentration here. But one of the problems that you get is if you have more demand than what you're correctly feeding chlorine, then you make something called dichloramine. And if you've ever been to a swimming pool and thought, that smells like chlorine, you're actually smelling dichloramine. If they have enough, the correct amount of chlorine in it, you shouldn't smell anything at all. Okay. So when the rivers came out, oh, where was it? February 14. On this chart, you can see where it jumps. And you're going to pass this around. Total organic carbon and ammonia jumped up. And at that point, we did not have online monitoring. And so the next day, customer service, their ears were tired because they had about 100 phone calls of people complaining about the water coming out of their taps going like a swimming pool. And so what we did since that time is we have online ammonia analyzer now. We also have a detector over here that measures chloramine concentration. So that way, if we do have an event, then we're ahead of it because if we're testing what's coming in our filter airflow, we can adjust our chlorine after that point, so that way we can up the chlorine enough, so that way we don't create dichloramine. And then the phone doesn't ring. Everyone's happy. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am? Like, how do you all collaborate on a day-to-day -day basis, especially when you have different fluctuations, like the turbidity and microorganisms, depending on the weather and stuff like that? And who kind of guides the decision-making on testing and increasing this. And okay, for yeah. most of that stuff, in the morning here we do a wide variety of tests on our source waters and the treatment basins and our finished water. And then also the operators 
Um, the other two shifts also test the water for those parameters. And then when we get down here, then all that data goes into our laboratory information management system, which is the control center, those guys that actually add the chemicals and make the pump changes and do the water cleaning stuff, then they have all that information so that way they can tell whether our turbidity has increased significantly or whether something's happened where one basin isn't getting enough ferric chloride or something like that so they can make adjustments and fix that as real-time basins. We haven't talked about staffing a lot. Terry referenced it. You know, lab Monday through Friday, typically, you know, normal business hours, but 24-7, 365, there are operations personnel uh, at this plant. Um, they're tracking uh, instruments in the plant. They're, they collect some of their own samples. They do some of their own analysis. So uh, quite, a, quite a bit of vigilance is, is, uh, is present to help us detect changes, but um, we need to be on our game to be to catch some of these events. Um, you get eight to 10 hours of water into this plant, you, you can't undo it. You get what you allow to come in. Uh, so hopefully we're vigilant enough on the front end to keep those events as narrow as possible. You know, in a, in a weird way, our job is really to take the dynamic nature of the raw water and, and, and mask it from the customer. Yes, the raw water should have some dynamicness to it. Dynamicness to it. By the time it leaves this plant, hopefully there's not a lot of changes in it. Uh, people are very good sensors and detectors of change. As humans, change generally means something bad has happened. In our business, that's not always the case, but that's certainly the challenge when the phone's ringing to try and convince people, yes, it's different. You're certainly sensing something the water remains safe to drink, that's kind of a tough message to deliver sometimes. So um, masking the raw water changes is an indirect way, really kind of why we're here.